This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the Huawei Mate Book. Now, you might think this is an Android tablet at first. It's so small, it's so thin. It's actually quite light, too. 1.4 pounds, which I believe works out to 620 grams. But this is a Windows 10 tablet. Small bezels here, Intel Core M inside, and a whole lot of accessories that you can get for it too. So none of these are included. One of the interesting things about the Matebook was the fact that it looked more affordable than the competition at $699 starting price for a Core M3 with four gigs of RAM and 128 gig SSD. Well, that's a couple hundred bucks cheaper than the base Surface Pro 4 and even the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S. That's $899 reviewed, but the Tab Pro S comes with the keyboard. So Huawei kindly sent us just about everything, in fact, everything that they make. We have the keyboard folio right here. This is also available in brown and would have a white interior as well. So this is $129. And then there is the pen. Of course you want the pen, right? The pen is 60 bucks. And it's an interesting pen we'll talk about. It's actually quite good. Then there's the dock because there's just about no ports on the tablet. And the dock actually comes with a faux leather case too that actually holds the pen. It's kind of nice. So this little guy here is going to set you back $89. But this gives you all sorts of useful ports like HDMI, regular USB ports, and all that sort of thing. So the pricing gets a little bit complicated there, doesn't it? So your $699 is just for the tablet. If you throw in all these accessories, $129 plus $60 plus $90, well, you're getting close to $1,000. Then there's the Core M5 version. You can get it with 8 gigs of RAM, which is nice, something you can't do with the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S or the cheapest level of Surface Pro 4 for those who must have a Core M for no fan design. Anyway, it's not necessarily cheaper. It is slightly different from all the competing devices. We're going to talk about it now. The 699 base model has a Core M3, 4 gigs of RAM, and 128 gig SSD. Ours is a little bit different. It has a 256 gig SSD with the M3. That's a configuration that doesn't seem to exist on pre-order sites right now, but we do have, well, early hardware here. Well, before release, let me put it that way, it is finished hardware according to Huawei. It has dual band Wi-Fi 802.11ac with Bluetooth 4.1 and that Wi-Fi has MIMO, pretty decent reception there. 5 megapixel front camera, good for video chat, no rear camera, sorry about that. Stereo speakers that are reasonably loud, a decent capacity battery and USB-C based charging. It's USB-C Gen 1. It's, it's not Thunderbolt 3 or anything like that, but for the price, that's certainly fair. If you want to really go to town, you can get it with, well, sort of go to town. It is a Core M5, after all, not the fastest CPU on the block, but Core M5 with 8 gigs of RAM and a 512 gig SSD will be $1,199. And there's an in-between model with 8 gigs of RAM and 256 gig SSD in the M5. That's $999. So it's not that inexpensive, especially if you want to add a couple of accessories on, but, you know, it's within the same price range as its competition. We don't often pay a whole lot of attention to packaging, but for something that's not wildly expensive, Huawei has really made everything look pretty nice and pretty plush. Each of these boxes looks pretty much the same design. You've got a little magnet style opening up here. It says Huawei design on it. It's all really very nicely done. You feel like you're getting premium products. You've got little diagrams. And by the way, take a look at this diagram right here because you get all these little adapter cables in the box. So there's a USB-C to regular USB and a USB-C to micro USB. And you're going to need that to charge the optional pen should you decide to purchase the pen. Huawei can make nice things, kids. They're no longer the budget company. I mean, witness the Nexus 6P here. Gorgeous device, high end. So they're, they're working on, on that. And this whole aluminum and curvy kind of look, nice design, it all carries over to the Matebook itself. I mean, this is... This is aluminum. It's very nicely done. Everything is machined well. If you take a look up top here, here's the power button. It sticks out kind of just the right amount. It's very tactile. And on the side here, we have the volume rockers. And nested in between is actually a fingerprint scanner. So you can log in with Windows Hello, and it works pretty well. Granted, it only uses a small strip of your finger, but it's going to have you do it several times and get different regions of your finger. So it actually works fairly well. You've got stereo speakers up top, too. And on the bottom, we have the Pogo connector, the magnetic Pogo connector. And that's for the, I think most of you are going to want this, the, the accessory keyboard. Though you could use any Bluetooth keyboard with this. So 
here's the keyboard portfolio. It is both a case and a keyboard, not unlike the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S that came with the keyboard. You're going to have to pay $129 for this. It is backlit. It doesn't require charging or anything like that because it gets all the power it needs from the Pogo connection here from the tablet. Typically, they don't consume a whole lot. Got a nice trackpad here. This is actually a very pleasant trackpad. I enjoy that quite a lot. We have 1.4 millimeters of key travel here, which is pretty deep for this kind of keyboard. But, you know, the whole thing just kind of flexes when you type. <laughs> and that's not so ideal. So it looks sort of like the Surface Pro 3 type cover a bit, but it's not as good an experience. It is supposed to be spill resistant and splash resistant underneath. I have not tested that with Huawei's nice review loaner. We'll just take them at their word for that. It's an okay keyboard. It's actually, I find, more usable than the Galaxy Tab Pro S's keyboard, which was just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's fake leather, which is fine with me. I mean, why kill cows? So let's talk a little bit more about the keyboard folio. Uh, some folks have complained that it's a little uh, flippy floppy, folly over kind of thing. You know, look, okay, I mean, <laughs> It's not that bad, but once you lift up on this, of course, it's going to let go. That's how it is. And one thing that I don't like is the, you've got fixed angles here. You've got upright, and this is where it's the most stable, obviously, because the bottom flap is touching down there at the base towards the table. And there's another magnet spot, so you can tip it a little bit further back, which is nice. And it is a little bit, you know, less stable, but then again, I'm shaking, you know, I'm shaking the table, I'm whacking on the thing. It's not that bad, folks. It, it's okay, you know, if you're riding on a bus on a New Jersey turnpike and there's a lot of potholes, maybe it's going to fall over, but for folio keyboard, none of them are super duper stable. This one is fine. One thing I'm not too thrilled with, they didn't think this through about how the magnets were going to work on this. So there's a magnet here, and that will put the machine to sleep. That's fine. That's a good idea, right? Boom. It's asleep, you see? Now it's woken up again. And there's a magnet here that holds it closed. But, you know, if you pick it up and you're just doing something like this, because you want to pick it up and show somebody, look, I've just turned it off. It will not turn on because the magnet on the back is actually affecting it. So instead of having just a little sensor on the front, it's a little too reactive. If you do that, it's going to turn it off again too. So beware <laughs> magnet madness. It does, however, make a nice carry case. We put it like this, we put it like this, and very clean, very nice looking, a little ridge to grip it. It looks a lot like actually the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S folio case. It's classy looking. It's fine with me in, the, in that respect. It's just uh, the magnet hell that, that's going on there. And also, you know, the keyboard is okay. It's not fantastic. If you do a lot, a lot of writing, you're probably going to be, eh. If you don't do super lots of writing, you might like it just fine. So that's your $129 keyboard folio. By the way, MicrosoftStore.com has this tablet on pre-order, and they have a, an accessory bundle with the pen and the keyboard folio for $100 instead of the normal price of $188. I think that's just a pre-order price, but keep that in mind. This should be shipping sometime in mid-July. The Matebooks display is really very attractive. It has high color gamut. It covers all of sRGB and 84% of Adobe RGB as measured by our colorimeter. And there you can see the result for yourself as measured with our Spider 4 Pro colorimeter. The resolution is 2160 by 1440, and that's the same as Surface Pro 3, less than Surface Pro 4 or the 12 inch iPad Pro, but still, that's a pretty decent resolution. I have no complaints about that. It's very sharp. Brightness, I believe at one point Huawei was claiming 400 nits of brightness. We measured 287 nits, which is decent. It's fine. It's zingy enough, but you know, it's not. 400 nits. The white point on this is way off. It's way too high. It's 8,200 degrees Kelvin, where 65 or 6,600 degrees Kelvin would be ideal. I suspect that's why the gamma is unusually low at 1.6. It should be 2.2. That can offset some of the, the over brightness and the blue white look of the display. But somehow it all comes together and ends up looking pretty good. I mean, really, I just look at that desktop. It's nice looking and it, it doesn't look too harsh and blue when you're looking at white web, web pages and all that sort of thing. So no, it's not up to the standard of the Galaxy Tab Pro S's Super AMOLED display. It's hard to really compete with AMOLED. And I would still prefer a Surface Pro 4's display because it's more color accurate. And I do do photo and video editing where I need to really make sure my results match. But I think for most people who are consuming content, they're going to really like this display.
We have the Intel Core M3, that's sixth generation Skylake CPU, base clock rate 900 megahertz, but it gets a nice fast turbo boost, well, decently anyway, to 1.5 gigahertz. You can also get it with the Core M5. And Huawei has said there will be a Core M7, but we don't know when that might be coming. We have the model with four gigs of RAM and a, a build that actually shouldn't exist, interestingly, in this country. It's not available. We have a 256 gig SSD, whereas the bundles we've seen so far have a 8 gig of RAM plus 256 gig SSD. So anyway, a little mixing and matching. The end result is it scores pretty much similarly to the Galaxy Tab Pro S and to the Core M3 version of Surface Pro 4, as it should. So here's our PC Mark 8 score, 2785. This is a machine that's fine for office documents. It's fine for streaming video, web, social networking. I, I really wouldn't want to use this for video editing. I mean, you can do it occasionally, you know, for your smartphone, you want to edit some footage, that sort of thing. But if you're into producing video in a reasonably serious way, you wouldn't want a Core M machine, especially the Intel HD 515 graphics are noticeably slower than the HD 520 graphics you'd get with a Core i5 ULV CPU. Geekbench 3 score right here, and again, this is what you would expect to see from a Core M3. It's a fine result. Here's the SSD result for the 256 gig SSD. There's no PCIe SSD in here. Sorry, you know, not for this price. So those are average results for a SATA interface SSD. And this thing is pretty much sealed tight as a drum. I'm assuming you probably have to pull the screen to get inside if you want to upgrade the internal. So I would suggest you get it with the amount of RAM and SSD you think you're going to need because I don't see any straightforward way of upgrading this later. So, ports. Well, this isn't going to take long. There's only two. Here's your headphone mic combo jack. This also has built-in microphone and stereo speakers up along the top over here. And on the other side, we have our USB-C port. This is USB-C 3 Gen 1, which is functionally equivalent to USB 3.0 in terms of data transfer rates. So, uh, again, like the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S, and this is the, the only port. You do get a dongle adapter in the box to go to regular USB in full size, you know, and there's also the one for USB to micro, so you can plug in, say, your smartphone, or you can charge the optional pen. So you really need this $89, they call it the Mate Dock. Well, it's not exactly really a dock. It's sort of like Dell's little USB-C uh, doohickus. What would you call something like this? It's up to you. Anyway, ports here are useful. You got your old fashioned VGA, you got your HDMI right there, so you can actually connect a monitor. And this is the little shorty USB C cable you're going to plug into your MateBook so it can talk to the device. There's another USB C outlet here, and that's to plug in the charger. We'll talk about USB C charging in detail in a bit. Two USB A. And you got Ethernet, so it's a pretty useful device. Let's have a battery and charging. Obviously, the battery is sealed inside. This is what the charger looks like. Your USB-C cable that's supplied goes in here. The other end plugs into the tablet. And, of course, you'd have the prong adapters that are appropriate to your country. Uh, Huawei sent this to us before the product has been released, so we're just happy we actually got the product, even if the prongs don't happen to match up for the United States. In fact, I didn't even have to use this because the 12-inch MacBook charger works for this. That's a USB-C based charger. The Dell Latitude 13s that we recently reviewed, its charger is also USB-C based. That worked too. The Nexus 6P charger did not work. Didn't do nothing diddly. Nope. Not. The battery, despite the fact this is so thin and so light, is a really pretty decent capacity battery. It's 33.7 watt hour. Uh, but as we've seen with other Core M devices, Core M is not really that power frugal, despite being a lower wattage CPU than the usual Core i3, i5, i7 used in Ultrabooks. Okay, no taking in art types. You know me, I'm the pen lady, so this is pen time right here. This pen, goodness only knows what it is. Huawei hasn't really said. If we go into Device Manager and look at the HID compliant pen, and we look at details, and we look at hardware IDs, it says WCOM. You, you know, maybe that is Wacom. I don't know. Although the interesting thing is if you look at something like Lenovo ThinkPad Yoga 460, which does have Wacom AES inside, the device driver doesn't say WCOM. So who knows? It probably maybe is some kind of uh, Wacom technology. It charges by, yank the, the, the end of the pen off, 
And there it is, sort of like the Apple Pencil right there. So it, it, it goes for 100 hours at least before having to charge it. So it's not really burdensome, and it's probably easier than finding a quadruple A battery like Intrig pens use, for example. Uh, so that's fine. But, you know, here's an interesting little trick. On the end here, there's a button too. What is it? It's a laser pointer. Ooh. So if you have cats or you're doing PowerPoint presentations, that can be handy. We have two buttons right here, and by default, one does right-click, the other does erase. And notice the pen tip right here. It comes to a fairly pointed tip, but not real pointy, and it's kind of wide. It looks a little like a fatter version of the Apple Pencil tip. By the way, the Apple Pencil does not work with this tablet. The Entrig Surface Pro 4 pen doesn't work. Wacom AES pens don't work. So this is its own technology. Anyway, you get an extra one of these tips in the box. And you might think it supports tilt, given that kind of design. It doesn't particularly. You don't get a different kind of line if you tilt it. But it actually works pretty well. It, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to pair it to use it. But kind of obscurely and not really well documented is if you press both buttons at once, you put it in pairing mode and you can pair to it. That doesn't do a whole lot for you. If you double click on one button, you can take a screenshot. If you double click on the other, you can launch OneNote. And there I've just launched OneNote. So here it is for writing. It has palm rejection, so I'm resting my hand on the glass. We have about a quarter inch of hover up to a half an inch. I mean, you'll, yeah. Yeah, it's about a third of an inch of hover, so it's not unlike Wacom AES. It works perfectly fine for note-taking. I, I like it quite a lot. It, it's rubbery enough that it doesn't feel too much like writing on glass with the hard tip. That's nice, too. Now, what about art? That's a bit more demanding. Now, the caveat here is if you're a heavy-duty artist and you're using documents with lots of layers, say, like Corel Painter 2016, or even Photoshop with many, many layers, this is not going to be the sharpest knife on the drawer. Of course, we do have the M3. It's the slowest of all possible, but it won't be as responsive. But it's usable enough, and for casual drawing and, and all that sort of thing, it works just fine. Now we have pressure levels right here. Here's a light line. Here's a heavy line. It's keeping up pretty well if I'm doing mad drawing like this. I cannot get it to draw a good straight line to save my life. Even if I go pretty fast, well, that's not too bad. It's harder than with the other pens. It's just an odd thing about it. And it gets real squiggly with diagonals. And let's use the ruler here just to test it out, too. That, that's actually worse than a free-drawn line. It is just, it, it's interesting that it's, it's better on, on a horizontal line like that. Let's do an up and down line. That's fine. So it's just the diagonals that are pretty darn jittery. But other than that, I really like the feel of it. I like the responsiveness of this working fine in Clip Studio Paint, tested in Art Rage and in Photoshop as well. It's going to use the modern Win, not WinTab drivers for this, and pretty much every art program supports that these days. So it's actually a pretty nice, pleasant experience. If I actually try to, say, sketch a face, in a natural way, it's not it's not bad at all. Keeps up with the work that I'm doing. Uh, I don't like it as much as the iPad Pro, I confess, in terms of feeling the most like a pen on paper kind of experience and responsiveness, but it's it's pretty decent, really. So how about the speakers? And by the way, here's our Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S review. If you want to see a comparison, it's amazing how similar they look. Notice the Samsung has a camera on the back. This guy only has a 5 megapixel front-facing camera. Uh, for vertical market people, that might make a difference. I don't think it's going to make a difference for most other folks. How many of you use your tablet to do video? So let's play one so you can see. This is a Samsung tablet. Much as it might look like an 66 percent volume. It's thin, right? It's it's pretty loud. It's a little thin, a little tinny, but honestly, for a 12-inch tablet, that is not bad sounding at all. Looks quite nice for playing video. Video, by the way, does seem to affect battery life more than just straight web browsing. I think that's why some folks who've reviewed this have found battery life not to be that great because they use video rundown tests, and lighting this screen must really take a toll on it because this isn't the, the, the best. If you're going to be doing a transatlantic flight on and want to watch movies, you know, five hours, maybe. So regular productivity, at least I'll get six. And for a size comparison against competing devices, of course, we have the 
6.9 inch iPad Pro over here with Apple's keyboard case. Speaking of floppy portfolio style cases, the, the Apple one isn't the most stable either. It does have an odd kind of keyboard, but actually I find it works pretty well. And on the other side, we have the Surface Pro 4 with the type cover, definitely the best keyboard among them. And also the most stable design since of course it has a kickstand on the back. It's not relying on a portfolio case to hold it upright. So there you get the idea of the size. Obviously the Huawei is going to be a little bit smaller than either of these. And if you'd like to see a SmackDown, shout out in the comments, and it can happen between either of these devices. Sorry, we no longer have the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S in-house, so we won't be able to do a SmackDown with that one. So that's the Huawei MateBook. It's a 12-inch tablet. It's a 12-inch laptop, thanks to the folio keyboard cover case here. And, you know... It's not bad, actually. It has a very vibrant display. It's a attractive keyboard folio. Not my favorite to type on. Trackpad's pretty good on this. Performance is Core M, which is to say not much different from any other Core M on the planet. Slower than a Core i5, certainly, but adequate for business use, for casual art, that sort of thing. It's beautifully made. It's beautifully packaged. Battery life, it really depends on what you're doing with it. If you're going to be using it hot and heavy with several programs running at once, lots of browser tabs, particularly if you're going to use Chrome rather than Microsoft Edge, because Chrome uses a lot more power and CPU cycles, then battery life is going to be around six hours, which is like a Core i5 Surface Pro 4. You're not gaining anything there, and it's less than the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S. But if you're using it pretty lightly, you're just surfing on the couch, that sort of thing, and you've got brightness at 50% or less, that, and not a lot of tabs open, not a lot of applications running, and then you, you really can get seven and a half hours out of it. So it does depend on how you use it. And that's typical of the Core M in some ways, so because it has such a low base clock rate, but a very aggressive turbo boost. Anyway, it's not a bad device for a first try from Huawei, who's never made a PC before. It's actually pretty darn good, but obviously there's room for improvement. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos.